Good evening. My name is Eric Elliott. I'm the Assistant Public Affairs uh, Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Skopje, North Macedonia. This evening, we're pleased to have a special guest with us who's calling in all the way from Washington, D.C. I'd like to introduce uh, Nina Jankovic, who is the, uh, I have to get this right, the uh, a Disinformation Fellow with the Wilson Center. Nina has conducted a lot of research on the intersection between uh, the East and the West and, and specialized in research on disinformation. She has a forthcoming book, How to Lose the, Disinf How to Lose the Information War, that will be published uh, in the next two months. Is that right? So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nina and turn the floor over to her. Thank you so much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Uh, here it's the afternoon, but I do wish I were in, in Skopje uh, enjoying some delicious Macedonian food. I've been there once before and hope to go back in the future. Um, so without further ado, let me just share my screen and we can get... two months is called How to Lose the Information War. And luckily, a lot of the lessons that uh, it talks about, lessons from Central and Eastern Europe, are extremely applicable to today in our current you know, informational moment amid the COVID-19 infodemic, as the World Health Organization is calling it. And I um, was really inspired to write this book when I was working in Ukraine um, as a uh, strategic communications advisor to the foreign ministry there as part of a Fulbright fellowship. And um, it just seemed to me at the time, and it, the 2016 election was going on when I was uh, in Ukraine, it seemed to me that the United States was approaching disinformation as if it was a completely new phenomenon when countries in Central and Eastern Europe have been dealing with it, not only coming uh, from the Russian government, of course, but domestic disinformation as well for many, many years. And so I thought I would investigate those countries and um, give some lessons learned for uh, not only the United States, but any other government that seeks to combat disinformation. And certainly everyone is doing that right now. So we are going to get into that a little bit today. Um, I always like to start and end my presentations with this cat. Uh, <laughs> I think it really encapsulates our response so far to disinformation. We talk a lot about content getting removed from platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Um, we talk about pushing back against bad actors like, for instance, Russia or China for the things that they're doing in the information space. But so far, I argue and my research shows that our, um, our response to disinformation has been just like, like this cat uh, or like the game of whack-a-mole, if, if you know that carnival game where the little rodent pops up and you need to hit it on the head, but they keep popping up, right? Uh, but in this case, it's whack-a-troll, right? <laughs> um, and so I argue that we need some more endemic uh, solutions that address the problem with uh, the root cause, which is that people are seeking out this information for, for some reason, whether it's you know, uh, that local news is, is closing up or whether we're in the midst of a pandemic and people are really fearful and seeking out this information. Um, so again, I'll get into this a little bit more, but we need to do a lot less of this in our response to disinformation. Before we go any further, I thought we would just define some terms because often in reporting about dis and misinformation, a lot of these terms are used um, interchangeably and actually they are not the same things. And I think to aid our understanding, we need to be very precise about the terms that we use. So disinformation is the false information um, that is spread with malign intent. So that might be uh, by nation states who are seeking to undermine others for their foreign policy privileges. That might be, uh, it might be people who are seeking monetary gain. And I'm sure you're all familiar with those Macedonian teenagers in the 2016 election. They are now the stuff of legends, um, but they were also spreading disinformation. There was that malign intent about it. Misinformation, on the other hand, is false information that is spread without malign intent. So that might be your aunt or uncle or grandma, grandpa on Facebook trying to share information that they think is helpful or that they believe in about the coronavirus, but actually um, this information isn't true. Uh, they don't know that and they don't necessarily have a malign intent behind sharing that information. 
And then we have propaganda, which often people will use as kind of an umbrella term, but actually it's a very specific type of information warfare. It's information spread to pers persuade an audience, usually with political connotations or on behalf of a government. So a recent example of a propaganda event that I like to give is um, recently the Russian government sent a plane full of ventilators and personal protective equipment to the United States to fight coronavirus. Um, and all of the boxes that were on the plane were emblazoned with from Russia with love. And then the Russian media wrote about that um, and how the United States was receiving Russian aid for many weeks afterward. And this was in order to message that uh, the Russian government was doing a good job dealing with the crisis and that uh, you know, the relationship between President Trump and Putin was going well, that Putin was helping other countries, et cetera, et cetera. So that's propaganda. And then we have trolls and bots, which everyone seems to use interchangeably, but these are not uh, terms that are interchangeable, actually. Um, a troll is an account that's uh, controlled by a real human being. Um, sometimes their identity is obscured, sometimes not. Sometimes people might control multiple tro troll accounts. We know that, for instance, the Internet Research Agency in Russia um, controls probably thousands, if not tens of thousands, of troll accounts uh, that it used during the 2016 election. But a bot, on the other hand, is a social media account that is operated entirely by a computer program. Um, so there's a human that's controlling thousands of accounts, but that's run on lines of code. So that's the difference between those. The other thing that I think is important to point out at the beginning, which we're seeing fully on display during uh, the coronavirus pandemic, is how disinformation is actually not all about fake news or false information. It can just be misleading. And often the most successful disinformation is grounded in a kernel of truth. It manipulates our emotions, it manipulates the trust that we have in institutions, in our politicians, um, and it, we're, it's able to be targeted at a very fine level thanks to social media, which I'll get to in a second. But I like this chart because it shows, uh, and it's quite old at this point, um, I've been using it in my presentations for three years now, but it shows how uh, trust is, is declining in a lot of the countries um, that I study in particular, um, and that in the United States from 2017 to 2018, trust declined in institutions 37%. Um, and this is a yearly survey that's done by the Edelman Trust Barometer. It's, it's quite interesting um, to see how these trends change over time. But if you look at it, um, the countries that have huge problems with disinformation are often ones where the trust in government is quite low. And I would wager that trust in uh, UK institutions, for instance, has fallen quite a bit um, since, this, uh, since this slide was made. So um, that would be interesting to follow up on, but they're certainly dealing with their own disinformation crisis now as well. And then we have the tools and tactics of the influence playbook. So, um, there are a couple things, and again, this is, this is stuff that foreign actors and also domestic actors use. Um, they can use bot or troll armies in order to amplify misleading or false messages. So making topics trend, making it look like a lot of people are sharing or reading a certain article when in fact that's just a network of bot and troll accounts. We can have government organized NGOs, gongos, or front organizations that seem like they're legitimate organizations either doing research or uh, activism, and I put activism in quotes there, um, in order to lend credence to narratives that are being spread by organizations like, for instance, the Internet Research Agency. And often those organizations are equipped with fake experts to do the same. So people who are uh, either inflating their credentials or have been um, you know, packaged to look like they are an expert when indeed they're, they're just a propagandist in many ways. Um, the Influence Playbook also includes cyber attacks and cyber crime, which informs what we call malinformation. Um, so these are the hack and leak operations, which we've seen in the United States and France, where documents that wouldn't be public are made public um, in order to try to harm usually a politician. Um, and cyber attacks and cyber crime certainly uh, are on the uptick during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the FBI and our Department of Homeland Security just released a, a warning to many people about 
um, the fact that cyber criminals are taking advantage of people's emotions, again, uh, so keep, keep an eye out for that. And then um, funding and organizing political protests and political parties is something that a lot of malign actors do. And I think it's important to note that, and you'll see this in some of the case studies that we're about to talk about, um, it's not just about posts being shared on the internet, it's about changing people's minds enough that they show up to protests. This happened in the United States and it's happened in many of the cases that I uh, look at in my book. Um, as I said, my book focuses mostly on Russian disinformation, so I think it's important to point out what Russia's goals are in, uh, in this you know, arm of its foreign policy. And it's generally to undermine democratic institutions and the Western or transatlantic political order in order to shore up both Putin's support at home and also uh, his global position at the global negotiating table. And I always like to point out that, you know, since the 2016 election, um, and especially if you go back a little further since uh, Putin's incursions into Syria and Ukraine, um, all, of the, all of these influence campaigns that have been surrounding those activities have certainly made the West pay a lot more attention to Putin than we did before. So I would say that he is achieving that goal and it's up to us now to push back against those narratives. But that being said, um, again, disinformation can definitely happen domestically, and one of the things that comes through in my book, and we'll talk about one case study um, where this is the case, is that countries that don't recognize their domestic disinformation problem have a very difficult time fighting foreign disinformation. You have to either decide that disinformation is a problem, regardless of the source, or that you don't care about it. Um, and I would say a lot, of, a lot of governments are trying to have it both ways right now, and that just does not work in terms of policy. And then, of course, there's the role that social media play. And this has been increasingly important um, since 2016, uh, as you know, the American consciousness has been uh, trained on social media companies, um, especially, there's of course the 2016 election interference, but Cambridge Analytica data scandal, um, dealing with users' personal data. I think people are becoming more aware of the fact that social media is not an unadulterated force for good in their lives. Um, and in this case, the social media essentially democratize the tools of influence so that anyone can access the same tools that allow you to very, um, very minutely target different people on the internet based on their demographic data, based on their likes and dislikes and their previous browsing history even. Um, so this is the, the, the real crux of why we're having such a disinformation explosion now, especially why um, during the COVID infodemic, um, we are seeing such, uh, such difficulty to find trustworthy information. Um, it's because social media has made it easy to put your message out, to target it to the people who are most vulnerable, and then it allows it to spread very, very quickly compared to the propaganda and disinformation of yesteryear. So now I'll get into the case studies a little bit. And you are all probably pretty familiar um, with some of these. Uh, the Estonia 2007 bronze soldier crisis is something that I view as the start of the modern information war. Um, and essentially what happened, and again, you're probably much more familiar than most of my audiences. Um, Estonia, of course, has uh, quite a high ethnic Russian population thanks to uh, military families which moved to the country when it was part of the Soviet Union. Um, and after the fall of the Soviet Union, Estonia, of course, pursued very rapidly uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. And Russia became unhappy about this <laughs> and unhappy about all the other countries in its former orbit that were doing the same thing. Uh, and because of the high Russian uh, population in Estonia, Russia was able to manipulate using Russian language media um, exacerbate, uh, manipulate and exacerbate the tensions in Estonian society. So again, this isn't necessarily about stuff that's fake, uh, although there were fake elements to it, and I'll get to that in a second. They, they took existing tensions about um, unemployment among the Russian population, about voting rights, about citizenship, um, about the way that the Estonian government was treating 
for instance, uh, monuments like this very handsome bronze soldier that you see on, uh, on your screen right now. So this monument um, was located in the center of Tallinn. It was a monument to World War II uh, war dead, and in fact, um, what also served as a tomb of the unknown soldier for many years. And um, Russia, using the Russian language media, was able to encourage some protests around this monument. Um, the Estonian government decided that it became enough of a flashpoint and an issue of public safety that they needed to relocate it, relocate it from the center of the city to the outskirts of the city, which if you've ever been to Tallinn, it's not very large. So it, we're talking about, you know, less than 10 minutes in the car. Um, but again, the government uh, decided to move this monument after it became a flashpoint and after the Russian language media had been writing about this and pitting Russians and Estonians against each other for uh, several months. Um, there's also evidence that Russia used covert actors in order to organize protests around the monument. So the monument was moved, um, riots and, and more protests broke out, which for Tallinn is, is very unheard of. Um, and in conjunction with that, there was a cyber attack to halt government and social services uh, because Estonia is a very wired country. Um, they were already doing banking online, very widespread in 2007. All the media were online, um, Estonia votes online, all of this stuff. So there was a, a distributed denial of service attack, better known as a DDoS attack, against Estonia to try to cripple the country. Um, luckily, Estonia was fairly well prepared for that and was able to get things back online um, almost without too much of a delay. Uh, and it was a wake-up moment for the country, which had been kind of ignoring its Russian population for a long time. And over the next 10 years, um, indeed through to today, the government decided to start investing more in the Russian population, not only investing in their integration into society, but investing in Russian language media so that Russians weren't forced to get their media from um, from Russian state services across the border, uh, investing in Russian education so that Russian speaking students could get education at um, better universities before they weren't available to them because those were Estonian speaking universities. Um, and if you look at the data about citizenship and about identity in Estonia, um, the younger generations especially are embracing even of, among ethnic Russian communities, embracing a more Estonian, a more European identity. Um, and there is uh, certainly you know, more uh, cohesion in society um, and they're becoming more resilient to Russian disinformation. The consumption of Russian media is, is on the downtick. Then there's the Czech Republic, which is an interesting case study for me because they were the site and still are the site of uh, the first unilateral government institution created to fight foreign disinformation. Um, this is the Center Against Terrorism and Hybrid Threats, which is housed in the Czech Republic's Ministry of Interior. And the government decided to create that because um, there was a lot of anti-EU, anti-migrant sentiment floating around in the Czech Republic. Um, and it was done through what we call information laundering. So this is when a malign narrative is packaged uh, in a legitimate, um, sometimes somewhat fringy, but a legitimate media platform in that country uh, in order to make it look more trustworthy. And we don't know um, very often if these uh, narratives are laundered through directly through the editorial teams or if they, for instance, see something on Sputnik or RT and decide, oh, we're going to pick that up and, and write our own story about it. Sometimes it's coordinated, sometimes it's not. But at any rate, um, the Czech government decided that it was necessary to respond to these narratives because, as you see on the left, uh, there were protests that were anti-EU, very anti-migrant, despite the fact that the Czech Republic never took a single migrant during the migration crisis of a few years ago. Um, so they placed this body within the Ministry of Interior, uh, which had responsibility for things like migration, and it was going to you know, monitor the internet for these malign narratives when necessary. It was going to fact check claims related to the Interior Ministry's mandate. Um, and 
In addition, it would also do some training for government employees. And it went along, it was about to be launched, and the president of the Czech Republic, Zeman, decided at that point that he didn't like this new ministry because his rhetoric was, was quite anti-EU, anti-migrant fairly frequently. He was worried that his own government was going to need to fact check him. And there was a large public outcry after uh, Zeman began, began attacking this Center for Te Terrorism and Hybrid Threats because people thought, um, and you know, you are familiar with this in, in North Macedonia as well, uh, people thought that after such a struggle for so long against uh, totalitarianism, totalitarianism and for freedom of speech, they were going to have another censor, another government censor working against their freedom of speech. So people got very angry about this, even though that wasn't the mandate of uh, of the center. Uh, people were saying that they thought they would have a button to turn off the internet, uh, which wasn't the case. And um, as a result, they met a lot of um, a lot of pushback uh, when they launched and during their recent presidential election, even though there was a lot of rhetoric going back and forth about migration and about the EU, they, they didn't issue very many fact checks because of the political nature of some of them. So it got them into a bit of a quagmire and their work, I think, in my opinion, is, is quite stymied um, or uh, undermined by the fact that there isn't a lot of government or public support for their mandate. And it goes to show, in my opinion, that the role of fact-checking is not necessarily something that the government should be involved in. Um, and now I have a few examples from Ukraine, uh, because it's an area of particular focus for me, as I said, because I worked in Ukraine. Um, and I just think it shows the depth and breadth of some of these campaigns. So here, um, this is just some of the competing narratives about the shoot down of passenger airliner MH17 that uh, the Russian government and the separatists in Eastern Ukraine have put out over the years. This is only two years and you know this, this graphic goes on much longer, but it's what I could fit on the screen. Um, you might wonder why the Russian government puts out different competing narratives about this stuff. It's often so that um, they can uh, essentially confuse people to the point that people don't want to engage anymore. They don't want to know uh, what the truth is because there's so many competing narratives um, that they just can't, they can't deal with it. It's a bit like what we're going through right now in the COVID infodemic. Um, and so this has been a very difficult thing for the U Ukrainian government to grapple with. It's also been difficult for the Dutch and Malaysian governments, which are involved in the uh, investigation into the crash. Um, and to this day, in fact, I just saw yesterday, um, <laughs> there was a COVID conspiracy theory going around that somehow tied into MH17, which you might think that these two events are completely uh, disparate and not connected at all, but uh, some conspiracy theorists found a way to convince, uh, convince them that, you know, COVID is actually a type of AIDS and that all these AIDS researchers were on H MH17 and that's why it was shot down in order to protect, uh, keep the world from getting an AIDS cure. It was very circuitous logic. But um, again, people look at this, they say, we don't know what happened to that plane. It might have been Ukraine, even though we know it was the Russian government beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, supplied the missile that brought down the plane. Uh, it might have been Russia, it might have been the CIA, right? No one wants to engage with it and the truth is lost. Um, this is another favorite uh, example of mine and one that I um, go into in great detail in my book. Um, you may be aware that in 2016, the, uh, the Dutch government had a referendum on Ukraine's EU association agreement. Um, and for the Kremlin, this was a perfect opportunity to undermine EU cohesion because uh, the Dutch really are not huge fans of the European Union and undermine Ukraine's EU aspirations at the same time. Um, so they, they had a number of tactics that they employed in the lead up to the referendum that would determine whether or not uh, Ukraine's EU association agreement was ratified. Um, that included information laundering, which we talked about before, where narratives from Sputnik appeared in Dutch blogs and political um, writing. Uh, we also saw a YouTube video, actually two YouTube videos, which purported to show the Azov Battalion, which is kind of a pseudo-military, paramilitary force in Ukraine, uh, threatening Dutch citizens. And I'll, I'll try to play that for you in one second. Um, but interestingly, uh, the Russian government also 
almost certainly sent fake Ukrainians to town hall meetings. Now I say almost certainly because some of these people might have been uh, Ukrainians living in the Netherlands who just showed up to um, you know, lobby on behalf of the uh, Donbass and, uh, and other separatist governments, it seems unlikely to me. But there were actually, and this is well covered in the New York Times, Russian citizens who showed up uh, in order to lobby against the association agreement um, in the Netherlands. It's very strange. And we know, of course, that uh, Russia has been heavily involved um, with some covert operations in the Netherlands related to MH17 and related to doping scandals. Bellingcat's research has showed this, but uh, there, there are Russian fingerprints all over, um, <clears throat> all over the Dutch referendum, uh, in addition to the fact that recently, and unfortunately this happened after my book went to press, um, we learned that there, there's almost certainly some funding of Dutch political parties that came directly from the Kremlin during the referendum and association agreement. And hopefully the sound will come through. If not, I will narrate it for you. But these are the uh, alleged Ukrainian paramilitary groups uh, threatening the Dutch if they are to reject the EU association agreement. This was quickly debunked, but not before it gained a lot of traction in the Dutch fringe media. So let's see if this works. So I'm not sure if you can hear that or not, but they were saying, you know, Dutchmen, we're going to find you and threaten you and perhaps uh, commit violence against you if we do not, uh, if you do not vote for, um, for the association agreement. And the Azov Battalion itself came, came out and said, this is not us. We wouldn't hold weapons like that. You can see that those weapons are toys. These are just actors. Um, and yet it did not make a difference in the association agreement, despite a uh, very you know, passionate strategic communications campaign on behalf of the Ukrainian government. <clears throat> it, uh, the referendum was passed and the Ukrainian government needed to find a diplomatic solution to getting its association agreement ratified. Um, we've also seen the proliferation of fake local news in, in Ukraine. And we see this um, now spreading in, in other countries outside of Ukraine. Uh, but we're seeing not only Sputnik and RT, but other Russian-backed groups creating fake news portals that look like local news. On the right here, you can see one that's calling itself Zhitomir Today, um, where they're talking about local issues, again, things people actually care about. It's not necessarily fake news. Um, and they are trying to spread divisive narratives through those emotionally based issues. Uh, Facebook has removed hundreds of inauthentic pages, groups, and accounts since 2017 that are just like this. And often they, they are around certain themes, not only the, the local and national government, but undermining trust in transatlantic institutions, which it shows, uh, surveys show actually that um, Ukrainian population is, is much, much uh, in favor of, of integration with, with your Atlantic uh, bodies. Um, but the Russian government continues to invest in these pages. And again, this is like playing whack-a-troll. We, uh, we can delete them, but it's very easy for bad actors to just start up these pages again. It takes them a little bit of time to gain community, but uh, the tools available to the bad actors mean that it, you know, it, it's democratized. It can get to anyone. Uh, anyone can do it fairly cheaply, particularly the Russian government, which doesn't have the human resources and monetary resource problems that um, many of its victims do. And here we're talking a little bit about the COVID-19 dis and misinformation. I thought I'd highlight two of the uh, more disturbing and, and perhaps interesting conspiracies and uh, pieces of disinformation that have been going around lately. Um, and on the left, uh, this is actually a piece of Chinese disinformation. It, you may have read that um, the text messages that many Americans and uh, British folks received in the lead up to our lockdowns here um, actually originated in China. 
Um, and they, they were as follows, you know, someone would get a, a text message trying to tell them that a lockdown was going to be instituted imminently and they should gather their belongings and make sure their families were safe. Um, and it might seem that there is no direct beneficiary to something like this, um, but actually it, it serves the greater goal of creating chaos, of creating confusion, of creating distrust in government, because if you hear something that says a friend of a friend said, that things are going to get shut down soon and then you hear a differing message from the government and then a couple days later things shut down it leaves you wondering who is in your corner and and what what to trust um, and this is actually a tactic that we've seen in ukraine as well uh, the russian government and the separatists often send fake text messages to ukrainian soldiers on the front lines telling them to desert their positions that uh, their families are going to be threatened if they don't do so um, so it shows how again uh, disinformation is something that's becoming much more widespread during this moment of pandemic because we are all worried, we're all fearful, we are all lacking information, even scientists are lacking information because of how new and scary this disease is. Um, and then on the right, we see another narrative, which I think is uh, more familiar, unfortunately, but something that has cropped up in a lot of Russian-sponsored media. This is from a Russian blog called South Front, uh, which is connected to one of those fake research agencies called Global Research in Canada. Um, and this article asserts that the COVID-19 pandemic was man-made and it is a plot to uh, give us all a vaccine that will implant a microchip in our bodies so that we can be tracked and controlled, essentially. Um, and this is something that showed up on a lot of Russian uh, disinformation sites recently. But I think, again, it's also extremely important to point out that we're seeing domestic disinformation as well in every case uh, that I have heard about. And I'm sure Macedonia has its own uh, narratives that are spreading around. But I just, for instance, moderated a call for the Wilson Center with experts from the Middle East. And they had different narratives about uh, COVID and how to protect yourself, whether it was about praying a certain number of times a day or drinking hot water a certain number of times a day. Um, again, we are united in the uncertainty and uh, heightened emotion of this crisis, and it's something that bad actors of all sorts are taking advantage of right now. So what can we do? When we're talking about foreign malign actors, of course, um, we have typical policy vehicles like sanctions where we can respond more directly. I would argue that because, again, the cost of these campaigns is so very little to many of the governments that are conducting them, sanctions, uh, unless they are crippling, it, it's just not going to be something that uh, they stop engaging in. And we've seen no real evidence that um, the sanctions that the United States has imposed, for instance, on Russia are, are doing much to deter Russia from uh, its malign information activities. So then we have to step back a little bit and think, okay, how can we get to the source? Well, social media is one of the tools that bad actors use, whether they are foreign or domestic, to spread disinformation. How can regulation help? And I could do an entire presentation on social media regulation. There are a lot of different approaches to this, some more democratic than others. Um, and there's a real danger of giving governments too much power in regulating social media because we don't want to endanger freedom of expression. So today, for instance, the French government just passed a law saying that uh, social media companies need to remove harmful content, whether it's uh, hate speech or terrorist content, or for instance, child pornography, within uh, a certain number of hours or be fined a very large amount of money. Germany has a similar law. But free speech advocates say that this gives the social media companies uh, a reason to basically just suppress any content like that and not actually make a substantive decision about whether it should stay up or down. And it also gives the government too much power to decide what content is legal and what content is not. Um, so there has to be something in between. I, I personally advocate for more transparency-based solutions because they empower citizens. So I would like to know when an ad is being placed, who placed that ad, where the advertiser is living, uh, if it's a political ad, you know, who they're working for, and what um, essentially allowed that ad to make its way to me? What was the targeting that was used to, to allow the ad to make it make its way to me? Because that can give you an idea, again, of how um, the advertiser hopes to manipulate you. That has to just do with ads. I would like to see a lot more 
transparency around other posts as well uh, related to things like uh, admins of groups uh, where we're seeing a lot of disinformation spread or um, uh, for instance, you know, information about uh, the different types of publishers on Facebook, whether they are a bona fide news organization, whether it's an independent blog, um, what the political leanings of these things are. And again, there's some issue with that because who decides all of those labels? Um, so it's a very big and thorny topic. I think there are reasons to advocate for an independent regulatory body, something like in the United States where we have the Federal Election Commission or the Federal Trade Commission that decides things like that. I would love to see a federal commission on the internet, uh, but I think we're very far away from that. But again, all of these things help empower people with more information. And I think we, like Estonia and some of the other case studies that I didn't have time to talk about today in my book, um, it shows that citizens-based solutions work. We've seen actually Ukraine employ some really great media, media and digital literacy training within their country, which is quite large and quite diverse, um, to a very positive effect. People fact check information more, people are more uh, distrusting rather than immediately trusting of things they find on the internet. And I think there's a lot of ways that the United States could do this. We could use our libraries, for example. We could do it through schools. I like the idea of professional development training in this area as well. And I'd like to see that coupled with civics so that people understand how government works, uh, that you know there isn't a deep state conspiracy theory working against them that their government is meant to be there from them that they are more involved with government and and asking for a more responsive government because democracy works better when people are involved in it um, and i think this is an extremely important point you know disinformation campaigns like like the mh17 conspiracy theories for example they want us to stay home and to be less engaged and to stop engaging with information and stop engaging with our governments, making our democracies a lot more fragile and have less legitimacy. And we have to fight back against that. So that's why I think these solutions are, are so important. And coupled with all of that, media and digital literacy, civics, cyber, and I, <laughs> all of that plus, I would like to see um, cyber hygiene and basic cyber awareness uh, heightened as well, because we're seeing many, many people, again, especially during COVID, being taken advantage of because they don't have proper cyber hygiene. They use the same passwords on all of their accounts. Um, and this, again, is a type of influence and information warfare tactic that we need to push back against. Finally, um, we need our, our leaders to really set a good example here. We can't fight disinformation when we're practicing it ourselves. And so, um, the things, for instance, that Czech President Zeman was saying about anti-migrant, anti-EU sentiment that were untrue that he was using to uh, score political points, that's a detriment to, to his democracy um, and to the fight against disinformation. So I try in my work to work with a lot of uh, MPs, members of parliament, uh, and members of Congress in order to drive home that democracy is what is at risk here. Disinformation is not a partisan problem. It can come for, for any of us. Um, here are just some quick tips about how I vet information when I'm on the internet. So if I see something that uh, I think is emotionally manipulating me, I first take a walk, <laughs> close your device, uh, or put down your device. Don't think about it for a little bit. If you find something nagging at you saying, huh, I'm just really not sure about that piece of information that I encountered, check the source. See if that source has contact information on its website. And that's not just a contact us forum, it's actual, you know, a masthead with an editorial board, uh, an address that's not just some empty building. Uh, check all of that stuff. Check the author. Does that author have other pieces? And if so, are those other pieces trustworthy? Check the text itself. This is called horizontal reading. Can you uh, copy and paste a piece of that text into your browser window, into a search engine, to see if it's coming up anywhere else, because often you see a lot of these fake news narratives recycled. Um, conducting a reverse image search is a great way to verify visual content. Um, and in most browsers, you can right click and search Google for that image to see when the first instance of that image comes up on the internet. And you'll see that a lot of um, untrustworthy articles recycle images from previous years. And then 
practice what I call social media skepticism. Understand that not everything that you read on the internet is true. It's really important. And then of course we have things like cyber hygiene. I personally use two-factor authentication on all of my accounts so that if someone did get my password, uh, they wouldn't be able to get in because you need a second proof of identity and that can come through an app on your phone or a physical security key. Um, you can use a password manager as well so that you can create complex passwords uh, for your accounts and, uh, and not have to remember them or write them down in an insecure way. Here's this cat again. So again, I think rather than playing whack-a-troll or playing the game that the cat is playing here on the screen, uh, we need to empower our citizens to be able to navigate the information environment better. And that starts a little bit with you and me uh, doing the things that we just talked about. And finally, this is a quote that I like from Thomas Jefferson. It shows that this problem is not something new necessarily, and it certainly shows that it's something within our means to solve. So he wrote, I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. That's all for me. Um, this is the cover of my book. You can follow me on Twitter. I love to interact uh, with everyone there. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll take uh, questions now. So thank you very much. So Nina, can you read the questions? Actually, let me read them to you. That way those listening can hear it as well. So we have Great. four of them here and there'll be others. First of all, it's pretty broad. What is the best strategy to fight this information? Um, so again, I think it has to be a combination of things. Um, but I do think any successful counter disinformation strategy will include education. It will include uh, really strong outreach to people and, and building awareness about how these tools and tactics work. I think that's critical. And I think too few governments are investing in that right now. Okay. The second one is your book title is How to Lose the Information War. Does that mean that we have already lost the war and can't do anything about it? If we can, what should we do to, what should, what, uh, okay. what should we do beyond the fact, fact checking to fight disinformation? So I don't think we fully lost. That's a, that's a great uh, question. It's, it's kind of a provocative uh, title on purpose because I think we need um, to recognize that what we've been doing so far isn't fully working. We are still having a lot of uh, foreign disinformation attacks, domestic disinformation, and almost every country is on the uptick. Um, we need to think about a more holistic solution. So not only does that include the education that I just talked about, uh, it does include some pushback against the malign actors, be they foreign or domestic. And again, I think we need to look at social media regulation that's going to be um, uh, democratic, but still provide people with the information they need to navigate the information environment. Um, so that's kind of the three prongs that I see. Uh, one other thing that I would mention um, that's come up in, in other research that I've done, uh, as well as the book, is we need a strong recognition from government that disinformation is a threat to democracy. Not every government has, has figured that out, and that's just beyond, you know, uh, foreign disinformation is bad, but it's okay when I do it. We need a bigger recognition than that, because the governments that have set out um, the fact that disinformation harms their national security are able to then bring their resources together to really uh, create a whole of government, whole of society solution to disinformation that doesn't just exist, for instance, in the Foreign Affairs Ministry and the Defense Ministry. It brings in Ministry of Education, Ministry of Culture. Um, again, these are people issues. So they create that cross-governmental response. And too few governments, I think, at least among those that I've studied, see it as a whole of government problem. It's just either given to the defense ministry or the foreign ministry and sometimes the intelligence ministries as well. And I think that's a mistake. Okay, the next question. Many reports are saying that disinformation campaigns are not showing a direct link to final election results, but still they undermine the, the democracy. Could you elaborate on how they undermine democracy if the voting process is not disrupted directly? Yes, that's a great question and, and one that I get a lot, unsurprisingly. Um, so 
there's two ways that democracy is undermined uh, thanks to disinformation, even if a single vote is not changed. And by the way, we'll never be able to find out whether, <laughs> uh, whether disinformation changes election results or not, because it's, thank God, it's impossible for us to track uh, if somebody sees disinformation and then what their vote ultimately ends up being. If we did that, it would have to be a very long study that you know people were self-reporting their votes. And um, at least in the United States, we count on vote secrecy. So uh, I don't expect to see that happen anytime soon. And frankly, as a researcher of disinformation, I'm not, I'm not worried about that because here is how democracy is undermined by disinformation. The first thing is that it leads people to disengage. Uh, they're seeing all of these competing narratives. They want to sit at home. Uh, they don't want to engage with their governments, as I was talking about before. So there, number one, democracy is participatory and disinformation undermines that participation. But number two, this is about reflexive control in some way. So even the threat of disinformation, or in the United States, the threat of uh, cyber attack, we're often talking about you know, malign actors, uh, meddling in our actual electoral infrastructure and voting technology. Even the threat of that can undermine participation. Uh, the fact that we're not trusting the systems that have, you know, uh, governed our elections for many, many years, that people believe that their vote isn't going to be counted, that also leads people to disengage in, in the act of not voting. They're not going to go out if they don't believe that their vote is going to be counted. So that's two things. Actually, I'll, I'll give you a third one as well. It's not just about participation. It's how we talk about our political situation. So in the 2016 election, with the malinformation, which I mentioned before, the hack and leak operation, against the Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee, um, whether or not you believe that that changed votes or, or not, it certainly changed the way uh, campaigns talked about themselves, both the Trump campaign and the Clinton campaign. It changed the media environment, the way that the uh, journalists were covering both of those campaigns. And as a result, it changed how we voters were talking about the campaigns. And I believe that discourse ultimately uh, leads to changed minds. And if our discourse is being affected by outside forces where information is being leaked that would have never otherwise been public, um, you have to wonder where, where does the line get drawn here? Um, and I think this is clear that uh, it had an effect on our discourse in 2016. And if something similar were to happen without the same laws, for instance, that France has, where uh, the Macron leaks happened right before the election, they went into a blackout period, no media covered those, uh, those leaks because it happened right before the blackout period. And actually, um, those that did, the, fr the French uh, people were quite savvy. They said, you know what, it's clear that some bad actor was involved here and we're just not going to pay these leaks any mind. Um, that's a totally different environment. And unfortunately, the United States, I don't think, is prepared for a similar thing should it happen again in 2020. And that's a, a clear way, I think, that disinformation affects uh, democracy. It affects our democratic discourse. Okay. In countries like ours, North Macedonia, and, while, and the whole region, we need to educate people through NGO engagement, teaching the young, put simple broadcast on TV, hard to read, so older people can understand and raise awareness. Do national programs uh, specific for each country for this kind of problem, or would you recommend national mm -hmm. programs for specific to the different countries? Uh, because it may be cheaper to prevent now than to resolve later. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And in fact, um, I, uh, when I was in North Macedonia a couple of years ago, got to engage with some of your NGOs and they seemed really inspiring the, the way that they were trying to reach out and educate people. And I think um, it's absolutely um, something that would benefit our democracies and their stability if we were to invest in these sorts of programs. So one thing that I've recommended uh, to our members of Congress here, um, as well as some government officials is, investing either in education programs that can go through the schools, as I mentioned before. Um, I think libraries are a great way to do this as well, but I also think it would be um, really great if we invested in local NGOs that were doing this sort of uh, activism and engagement because those organizations are often more trusted in society than, for instance, uh, anything that has a government 
branded seal on it, you know, uh, even if that's a school. Um, libraries in particular are quite, quite well trusted. Um, another thing that I would add to all of that is that public media is hugely, hugely important. Um, we in the United States lag behind, I think, with our, our investment in public media, but in countries that have higher investments in public media, there's a trusted source of information at all times. I love a statistic about uh, the, the BBC, which I think in, uh, this was a 2018 statistic, uh, Brits were asked, in a time of crisis, uh, which of these broadcast agencies would you trust? And almost 60% of British people said that they would trust the BBC in a time of crisis. And I find it hard to imagine a media outlet that 60% of Americans might trust right now, even our public broadcaster. Um, but it allows people a trusted source of information um, that they know, you know they can go to in a time of crisis. Um, and it's not just about building awareness uh, through, through you know, media literacy and things like that. It's also about creating an information ecosystem um, that people feel uh, some modicum of trust in that they can navigate without that, that overwhelmed feeling that they know that they're not being manipulated at all times. So an interesting statistic I read showed BBC as the most trusted network in the United States as well. Wow, I haven't heard that one. You'll have to send that to me. <laughs> so this is kind of a, a similar question. When you say education, do you think media literacy should be incorporated in the school system? So I think that has to be a, a port, oh, excuse me, a part of it. Um, but I would like to see it reach the voting age population as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about a program that was implemented in Ukraine um, where it was focused on adults. They also have now a, a secondary school education program where media literacy is um, kind of combined with a bunch of other subjects like history and Ukrainian language and even art. Um, but the first time they ran a program like this, they did it through libraries. Again, I'm a big library advocate, love libraries. Um, and essentially they trained a bunch of people who uh, were well known in their communities. They went out to Ukraine's regions and those trainers then trained people to deliver a media literacy training. Um, and as a result of that training, the people, even 18 months after the program were over, was over, the people who did the program um, were fact-checking things more. Uh, they remembered the, the things that they had learned. And a lot of them actually went and uh, paid it forward and taught other people about what they had learned at the training. And it wasn't politicized. It was just, here's how you know you're being emo emotionally manipulated. Uh, it was about... Uh, here are some easy ways to check the sources that you're seeing on the internet, like some of the things I showed you today. And it also included a unit on hate speech because that's important and it's certainly something that uh, creates the emotion that this information thrives on. Um, and it was really quite, quite successful. So I think it's important that it's incorporated in schools, um, but also that it reaches the voting age population. In the United States, we have a little bit of difficulty with the school situation because we have a federal education system and states are in charge of the curriculum, uh, their education curriculum. So what I've suggested is, again, a grants program where uh, there is money available to states and other organizations that want to undertake um, this sort of training or education with an approved curriculum, and it would have to be a, a curriculum that was entirely depoliticized, the Department of Education would develop in coordination with experts, um, or each state could do that in coordination with experts. But I think there are ways around this. Um, and Germany actually has a, a pretty good approach to this, and they have a similar federal system. So it's not impossible, but it does take generational investment. And sometimes it's hard to convince politicians <laughs> that they should do something that is an investment for the future rather than something that's going to see returns uh, in the next two to four years. And um, it's this is my personal uh, soapbox issue, if you will. I like to get up and, and remind everyone that this is, is a critical issue and that nations like Sweden and Finland that have been investing in this for a very long time uh, have less of a hard time with disinformation because they have built those resilient media literate societies for many, many decades. Okay. What are some specific examples of responses to disinformation, such as programs, education campaigns, by civil society that have worked? So I mentioned the one in, in Ukraine, uh, Learn to Discern, 
Let me try to think of some others by civil society. There are, of course, a proliferation of fact-checking campaigns um, around the world, uh, many of which are, are here in the States, like Snopes or PolitiFact. Um, and there's a Stop, Stop Fake in Ukraine, which is another uh, fact-checking campaign. I think they all serve um, a good purpose to correct the record and make sure that uh, researchers, et cetera, have access to information about disinformation. But, um, and there's always a but, unfortunately, fact-checking campaigns are shown uh, to often have the opposite effect of what they are intended to do. So if someone sees a piece of disinformation and then they read a fact check, they're actually more likely to believe the false information or more likely to remember the false information rather than the, the information that's been corrected. So um, it's a problem. There's also a problem of, of reaching your audience there because if certain people are being targeted with dis and misinformation, they don't even know they're being targeted. Um, they're not going to necessarily seek out fact-checking uh, as a result because they, they have no idea that they're in this bubble that's been created. Um, so I worry about those. I think they, again, serve a purpose but are not necessarily the most impactful. Um, but there are a lot of other um, media literacy initiatives um, that I know less about because I haven't lived in those countries. Another thing that I would say is important uh, and we often kind of leave out of civil society, quote unquote, is investigative journalism. So there are several outlets in Ukraine. There's the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which is based in Sarajevo. Um, there are a number of other uh, projects related to corruption reporting in particular. And I think the work that these investigative journalists do is absolutely critical to informing people not only how disinformation campaigns work, but how they are funded. Um, which you know we know through in Russian investigative journalists, in fact, about the existence of the Internet Research Agency and how it's funded. Um, they did all the legwork that that led that into public consciousness. Uh, so investigative journalism and, and public media are critical um, as we're fighting disinformation, and I would certainly lump them in as part of civil society. Okay, this is from one of our uh, partners from outside of the country. Are there any automated systems of detecting and filtering disinformation and misinformation? I am thinking of building something like that for the Armenian media market and was wondering what uh, would such an automatic system need to be to, need to have to be effective? So there are. Um, there's something called NewsGuard, which actually I think is working, I'm pretty sure it's working in Georgia, or they've at least talked about uh, employing it in Georgia. I'm not sure if it's been... Um, uh, launched there yet, but essentially it gives um, every news site a rating, uh, like a grade or a nutrition label that says, you know, is this trustworthy information? The problem that I see with those sites, uh, although I think they're really useful for a, a person who has the right mindset, is that the people who are most susceptible, again, to all of these narratives aren't going to trust a browser extension that labels their news sites. And they're going to say, if they see you know, their favorite disinformation site labeled with an F minus grade, they're not going to trust it anymore. They're going to say, oh, that's fake news. Here's the real news. And this whole browser extension, I'm going to you know, invert it. And the New York Times, which gets an A, is now going to get an F because it gave my fake news site an F that I like to read. So there, there's, again, a supply and demand problem there. And I tend to think that the best way to, to reach out to those people who might be vulnerable to disinformation, um, and actually this is something that I've been talking to people a lot with regard to coronavirus, because people are sharing things on Facebook. If you see somebody that's made a comment that you know or you think is false, it's better not to approach them publicly about it because they're going to dig their heels in and defend their position. If you can message them privately and say to them, hey, I saw you share this article. I was wondering why you believe this. Um, and then try to help them defend their position without using disinformation or false information. Um, I think they want to be right. They don't want to be proved wrong. And if we do that in a more human way, often the internet takes out our, you know, very personal reactions to things. Uh, we have more of a chance of convincing people. Um, there are downsides to that in that people aren't going to see the fact check happen in real time. 
Um, but I think, you know, this is the way to approach it. And, and I, I just worry that the people who are really vulnerable to the most pernicious disinformation aren't going to trust a ranking system that's created by some unknown uh, character on the internet. Okay, uh, fake news debunking websites are popular and a number of them is growing, and the number of them is growing. Uh, do you have data on this trend? Uh, uh, and do, do they actually work? Do they give, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we talked about that a little bit. Um, I am, uh, I doubt their efficacy sometimes, but I think they're useful for researchers. Um, there is the Pointer News Institute, which keeps track of fact checkers and then the International Center for Fact Checking. I might have gotten the acronym wrong, um, but they do like a, um, a training for fact checkers to make sure the standards are, are um, correct across countries. And uh, yeah, I think that's where you can find the, the most trusted ones. Although again, there's the supply and demand problem and uh, people who have that label might be considered fake news by certain other people. Um, I think, yeah, I mostly answered that question before, but it's a good one. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have time for a couple of more? Sure. Okay. Uh, one of our uh, Fulbright scholars who, was, who went to Kent State asked this question, how big of a problem does this information have to be before authorities realize it is a problem and they need to do something? <sighs> That's the, the, the million dollar question, I think. I mean, um, Sometimes it's really difficult in my field because uh, I look, and this is you know, my personal opinion, it's not the opinion of the Wilson Center. Uh, I, I wake up in the morning and in, in a lot of cases, I feel like we in the United States are in the same place that we were in 2016. We've done very little to deter foreign interference. And now we've seen again, this proliferation of domestic uh, disinformation as well. Um, a lot of this depends on the political situation in the country and whether or not authorities have politicized the problem of disinformation um, and recognize that, again, it is that threat to national security, threat to democracy, uh, regardless of your political affiliation. Um, and I think it's not necessarily about how big the problem is. There are plenty of countries, like, for instance, in the Czech Republic, where the problem was significant, but I would say not anywhere near to what the United States experienced or what neighboring Poland experiences, for instance. And yet they created um, this government agency, which although it was stymied by its own government, was, was created to, to address the problem, right? So it's more of a question of politics, which is a very sad thing to realize. Um, but I do think that there are champions throughout um, civil society and throughout government uh, and I just choose to find my allies and start to work with them. So there are great people across the US government, many of them in our embassies, in fact, who are doing work on the ground on these issues. Um, there are uh, individual members of Congress of both parties who, who find that this is their, their issue that they want to champion. And I very happily go in and brief them or do hearings with them um, when it's useful. And uh, unfortunately, it's not a sprint. It's not a, um, it, it is a marathon. <laughs> it's going to be a very, very long um, investment for us and uh, I think a lot of other countries as well. But um, every little bit counts and I hope that my book, when it's out in the world, will give Americans in particular a new perspective on this issue um, and help them understand kind of the democratic uh, consequences of this problem, not only here, but in Europe as well. So speaking of embassies, this is uh, our public affairs officer asking this question. I'm wondering what you think are some of the more successful civil society groups working in this space. If you could cite any examples of what they're, what they're doing that's working. Sure. Um, and some of these aren't necessarily like full-blown initiatives. Some of them are uh, things that are a bit uh, scrappier than that. So I've mentioned already the Learn to Discern program, which is run by IREX in Ukraine and is done in partnership with their Ministry of Education. Um, there is an interesting project working in Georgia um, where some uh, public intellectuals, let's call them, <laughs> have paired up with uh, Georgian media personalities, so comedians, actors, and I think a few music musicians as well. 
and they train them on disinformation and, and how malign information tactics work. And then they send them to their hometowns. And a lot of them are from outside of the capital. So they go back to Zugdidi or somewhere where they're from. Uh, and they do a show, whether it's you know a comedy show, stand up, or they do a concert. And they also talk about disinformation, which I think is, is quite genius and actually has uh, harkens back to some of the public media efforts that the uh, US government did, for instance, around World War II. Um, this is not government sponsored. Again, like I said, it is uh, done entirely through civil society. And I think it's interesting. There's actually a lot of um, research done in the public health sphere that shows that things like hand washing, for instance, in African villages or just basic hygiene techniques out there are more adapted, not um, in sort of a contagion theory where one person does it and then the next person does it and then their neighbor does it. It's actually when it gets an early adopter who's an influencer in that, uh, in that community who can then kind of evangelize, for better or for worse, those tactics. Um, and so there's some research about this with disinformation as well. There's a book called How Information Spreads that uh, is done by a researcher out of the University of Pennsylvania. And it makes a very convincing argument that this is the way that we need to approach uh, awareness building about disinformation. So that's something that's going on in Georgia. Um, I think a lot of the public media initiatives, as I mentioned before, including Chromadska in Ukraine, OCCRP, which is Europe-wide, but based in Sarajevo, uh, ETV Plus in uh, Estonia, although that is partially government funded. Um, all of these are really good initiatives as well. Uh, and then Learn to Discern, which was uh, deployed in Ukraine, the media literacy program, is now actually being uh, tried out in the United States because we have enough of a problem that our own international organizations are now um, setting their sights on, on the homeland, so to speak. So they've got a program going on in Newark, New Jersey, and another one somewhere out west uh, that I forget exactly what state it's in, but two very different communities um, where they're trying out these media literacy frameworks as well. So that was kind of all over the place. I hope it was helpful. I can give you a, a more detailed list um, uh, offline. Okay. Um... Do you find correlation among government open data availability and fake news? I hardly find open data sources to cite my reports briefs while most of the colleagues use journalistic texts to support their stories. Yeah, this is a huge problem actually. And, and the media can be um, <laughs> kind of uh, complicit in um, spreading misleading conclusions about disinformation. So, uh, for instance, we have seen with regard to coronavirus disinformation, a lot of assertions about who is behind what um, different campaigns, and especially since 2016, the American media like to jump to the conclusion that Russia is behind everything. And until I see the back end evidence, I don't like to say that because it could be any variety of actors. Um, is it hard to find the open data uh, to kind of uncover these campaigns? Uh, yes, but it's not impossible. And the researchers at Bellingcat, um, in addition to first draft news, both have really good uh, toolkits available online for researchers about how to uncover this stuff in the open source environment. Um, so I think that is, is those, I would add those two to the list, by the way, because they definitely increase our, our media literacy and awareness of information operations. Um, the other problem with this is that the social media firms aren't very transparent in their um, information sharing. So when Facebook takes down, for instance, pages in Ukraine, we only know that they've taken down 400 pages and they share a couple of examples, but we don't see the whole thing. And something that I would really like to see more of is social media firms doing what Twitter does, which is sharing everything that they've taken down so that researchers can go through it. I think especially companies like Facebook, which are multi-billion dollar companies, should have the wherewithal and the um, resources necessary to create like a museum of disinformation so that people can see if they've interacted with that content, they can see uh, what it looks like and how you know it behaves, who it was targeted to, all that stuff is really important. And 
uh, for, for people's understanding. And the social media companies have been, I think, remiss in, in not giving that data up. And of course, it stymies people like you and I who are doing that research as well, because we have to kind of go around terms of service of, of those social media platforms in order to get the information we need. Okay, so two more. <laughs> the term <laughs> fake news is often abused by the political elites for silencing media that do not report the way they expect or they want. What is your opinion on this? I 100% agree with you. So uh, interestingly, <clears throat> I got into a fight with my publisher, well, a discussion with my publisher about the subtitle of my book. So it's How to Lose the Information War, Russia, Fake News, and the Future of Conflict. I really didn't want fake news in the subtitle, but of course it's to say how to lose the information war, Russia, disinformation, and the future of conflict doesn't quite have the same ring. Um, so I had to add something to the beginning of the book where I talked about the term and how I think it has certainly been abused by politicians. And it's, uh, they're all over the world now, folks using the term fake news to describe any piece of information they find politically inconvenient. Um, I think that is really dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous to journalists, not only um, as their profession and in their trust, in the public's trust in them, but also uh, for their safety, frankly. We've seen some really scary things happen, even in the United States, but certainly in Europe, uh, with investigative journalists who um, have crossed the wrong people. So I think it's extremely dangerous. Uh, it, it, is undermining the fight and um, any programs that we have to counter disinformation and sends completely the wrong message to citizens uh, when those terms are used. And I, if I could snap my fingers and make every politician stop doing that, I would. <laughs> okay, so the last question. Uh, the world is definitely reshifting and reshaping and media as well as the, the gen I can't, this is, is reshifting and reshaping and media as well as the general public is no exception. Can we expect that the pandemic due to the horrifying outcome, learn more on the side of the credible information, or lean, I'm sorry, lean more on the side of the credible information, and that it worked in favor of the neutral public becoming more aware of the need to at least double check news? You're the second person who has asked me this in, in the past uh, week or so. I hope so. Um, I think it's too early to say because we are still seeing here in the United States, um, for instance, a video that claims that the pandemic was planned. Even though Facebook decided to take that video down, we're still seeing it reshared millions and millions of times, even though it's been thoroughly debunked in, in multiple places. So uh, again, I think um, until we're out of the pandemic, which might not be for a long time, uh, it's going to be difficult to get people to abandon their emotional instincts, uh, to protect their families, to seek out information. Um, and until we're on the other side, I, I'm not going to <laughs> assess whether or not we've done, done the job or not. Um, and unfortunately, another consequence of, of the pandemic is that people are tired of consuming information. This is true for me, and it's my job. I, uh, I think a lot of people are just turning off and, and disengaging entirely, which we talked about the danger of that already. Um, but I hope that when they re-engage, they're going to be doing it with a bit more, um, uh, what's the best word, a bit, a bit more reason and a bit more uh, carefulness um, rather than just you know, searching for any information that suits their worldview at the time. Uh, but again, really too soon to say, unfortunately. Okay, so we have one less late-breaking question, as well, and then we'll call it an end. Do you have evidence of media attacks on elected governments orchestrated and sponsored by oligarchies in the Western Balkans? That is a very specific question. <laughs> so my, uh, my experience in the Balkans is, is quite limited um, to a couple of days that I spent in North Macedonia ahead of your referendum as kind of part of a... Um, information gathering mission that, for an organization that I was working with. So uh, I don't have specific evidence of that, but I would look to the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which has done some great reporting on how media in the Balkans is influenced by uh, the big spenders in the region. Okay, so thank you so much for talking to us, Nina. Thank you for having uh, me. It's great to uh, be with you. Stimulating, interesting discussion. Uh, and thanks for coming all the way from Washington to visit us. Well, I hope it's in person next time. <laughs> we hope so too. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.